2020. In a new op-ed in the Washington Post, MSNBC political analyst Hugh Hewitt argues that for Democrats, impeachment is a, quote, flop, and so are their 2020 candidates. Hugh Hewitt, host of the Hugh Hewitt Show, joins me now. Also with us, Democratic strategist and former executive director of the New York State Democratic Party, Basil Smeichel. Thanks both for being here. Uh, Hugh, let's start with uh, your article first. A and you're saying in that article, and I gave a summary of it, but you're also saying Pete Buttigieg, if you were to pick one uh, for the Democratic side, is the interesting candidate. And, and why might he be the interesting one? Because I, I guess some folks might say, I don't quite see that either. Mm -hmm. I, I call him, and good evening, afternoon, Richard, perpetually poised Pete, no matter what they throw at him, he is always poised, and I watch as a Republican, I'm a conservative Republican, I watch the field taking form, and the only one who I see without massive drawbacks is Mayor Pete. I see, I can't even begin to understand why Elizabeth Warren is bringing up conflicts of interest. She used to work for Kaplan and Drysdale, this enormous law firm, and so if she opens that Pandora's box because uh, a young Pete Buttigieg works for uh, McKinsey and Company, I think she's indicating panic on her side. I have to infer that, but I am inferring that when you start attacking someone, and they're all starting to attack Pete, uh, Vice President Biden, Senator Warren, it tells me that the mayor has become their number one threat. And certainly as a Republican, I think he poses the greatest challenge to President Trump. Uh, half his age, completely different personality, a temperament that's 100 percent opposite. He's the one who would worry me. Mm. Basel, what do you think? An interesting argument being made here and, and reflect also on what we were talking about with the road warriors and and that is right now, as they go at each other, whether it's, a, whether it's a law background and a law firm experience you might have, or working for a strategy firm, a law firm might be a little bit more non-headline friendly. <laughs> well, you know, I, I honestly just think it's Pete Buttigieg's time in the spotlight. That's really what we're seeing here. There probably is a little bit more to the engagement mm -hmm. by, uh, between between him and Elizabeth Warren, because if you remember in an earlier debate, it was Mayor Pete that went after Elizabeth on her on how she was paid for her health care plan, and that actually vaulted him vaulted him vaulted him into the role, into yeah. the uh, polls. And it, it caused Elizabeth to slip a little bit. So I think there is an interesting sort of tension there that I'm sure we'll see continue to play out. But I am not surprised that candidates are taking, uh, have, have sharper elbows right now because we're getting closer. You see an irascible Joe Biden sort of come out in, in that, in that sort of town hall. I'm not sure why he wasn't prepared for that question. He, uh, with respect to his son, he needs to be more prepared for that. But I imagine that all of the candidates are going to be going after each other more so, uh, now as we get closer, especially since there's so few of them on a debate stage now. So few. Well, I guess everything's <laughs> relative, right? right yeah. <laughs> Things go Down by. from 21 from and, before. And it could be, you know, Hugh, uh, reflect on why Joe Biden, this is not his first rodeo, and he, he was asked the question uh, there in the Midwest and not able to handle what some might say, what Basel's in, uh, intimating here, a, a straightforward question that he has been asked in the past and will be continued to be asked going forward. Well, you know, I, I think the vice president reads headlines like we all do. And I try again to infer from what he did that he was upset that day. And maybe it's Reggie Love endorsing Pete Buttigieg. Maybe it's Austin Goolsby, who's a very, very well-respected Obama-era alumnus. So you have the president's body man, Reggie Love, and the president's cha chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors, President Obama, mm -hmm. both endorsing uh, Pete Buttigieg. And Joe Biden's in Iowa. He knows he's behind in Iowa. He knows if he loses Iowa and New Hampshire, South Carolina is not going to save him. So he's testy. Add in a parent's natural inclination to come to the defense of their child, whatever the facts. And he let slip uh, what I heard is saying fat, sort of a fat shaming moment that got a lot of play on Twitter. Some people dispute that and say he said facts, but I listened to it pretty closely. Mm -hmm. The 100 push up or you know, push up contest. It just was a very bad look uh, for Vice President Biden in a very good state for Pete Buttigieg. And then it's on in New Hampshire where Elizabeth Warren has a built in advantage from mm -hmm. the Boston media market. A lot of explanations, but none of them good for Vice President Biden. It, it, one of the, the polls that Democrats might like is one that just came out. Uh, and this was Trump, uh, President Trump's approval rating in key swing states that came out from Morning Consult. And when you look at approved, disapproved, this does not necessarily mean who do you vote for blindly, just approved, disapproved. You can see Iowa, Wisconsin, 
Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, we know three of those key uh, firewall states were essential in 2016 for which who was going to be sitting in the White House. So, Basel, what does this mean for Democrats? It's, it's a, a high number. Because you, it's, you're in the plus 50 range. Yeah, what it, I think what it says is that we're going in the right direction, but we have to be careful. You had three members of Congress on earlier. And my concern is that after all this impeachment is said and done, we need to get back to the business of policy, appropriations bills, other types of bills that actually need to get pushed. Even if they die in the Senate, we have to be able to go back and tell our constituents that we were doing the business, that we continue to do the business of the people. Because one thing that is going to happen mm -hmm. after the... Uh, as these impeachment hearings go on and as these members of Congress go back home, they're going to have individual conversations with their constituents to continue to promote their particular narrative. And so it takes it off of TV. It puts it it's right the into the community. Well. It, it, right, yeah. Exactly right. It puts it right back into the communities. Yeah. So we have to be prepared when this is all said and done to pivot right back to policy. You know, we look at those uh, swing states, uh, which you know well here, Hugh. Um, I, I reflect on what Rick Wilson wrote this week. You probably have heard about it in the Rolling Stone where he's, it's titled The Traitors Among Us. He is pointing his finger basically at key comments being made by certain Republicans that are in support of what the president has done right now. And he puts in question here whether they are being traitorous or treasonous. Well, there are a couple dozen Republicans who are always available to say something terrible about, pre about President Trump. I asked them the toughest questions of anyone in the 2016 campaign, mm -hmm. so I know they're tough questions that the president has to answer. But we keep coming back to, I look at the Marquette University Law School poll in Wisconsin, where it's totally flipped on impeachment. 53% of registered voters now oppose it, 40% uh, approve of it. And I look at the Emerson polls that came out just this past week, where the only one beating Donald Trump is Bernie Sanders and not by a lot. There are a couple of ties, Elizabeth Warren, Pete Buttigieg is behind him, Joe Biden's behind him. I think impeachment is smothering the Democratic message that it is not popular, that it's a disservice to the American people. And I read as quickly as I could the Nadler report today, and on page 31 it says, oh, let's get rid of this, I'm paraphrasing obviously, don't, you don't have to have a crime to impeach a president. The implication of that is there is no crime. So as time goes on, I think it's going to become a greater and greater anchor around every Democrat's neck. And so I, I think he's right. We, they they got to get away from this as fast as they can. Yeah, and, and just to allude to page 31, it says, it is occasionally suggested that the presidents can be impeached only if they have committed crimes. That position was rejected in President Nixon's case and then rejected again in President Clinton's and should be rejected once more. And I think that's what you're alluding to there. Great conversation. Yes. Uh, having two smart people here. Hugh Hewitt, Basil Smeichel. Uh, enjoy your weekend. Thank you.